Hi, uh, I'm Owen Williams. Um, I'm the uh, Chief Executive of the uh, Coldale Huddersfield Foundation Trust. Um, I'm going to just do a little bit because I've got the shift after everybody's eaten. So I've got that shift. So I just want to just do something just to get people just thinking a little bit. Could you just give me a show of hands if I said to you, do you know the character Jack Reacher? Just a show of hands. Jack Reacher. Okay, if you just put your hands down a sec. Um, can you just give me a show of hands if you know the character Alex Cross? Okay. All right, thank you. And finally, if you could just give me a show of hands if you know the character Anastasia Steele. Anastasia Steele. Now, is that because some people are reluctant to put their hands up? Or you don't know what the hell I'm talking about? <laughs> so if I say Anastasia Steele, main character in Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> and what I've just given you there is a little bit of an insight into um, my Kindle apps. Okay? So I, I will put my hands up. I've not read it, it's my wife's. Um, <laughs> but um, the reason why I want to do that is because I've got a few other books in my Kindle apps that are, are pertinent to what I'm going to talk about um, today. Um, one of them is quite an important book by a lady called Julie Bailey. And um, Julie Bailey is the author of a book which is called From the Ward to Whitehall. And Julie did a lot of work, particularly around Mid Staffordshire Hospital, which some of you may or may not know about, and maybe some of the colleagues who are not from the UK might not have picked up on, and I apologise for that. Um, but Julie runs an organisation called Cure the NHS, and Julie runs a little cafe um, somewhere in Staffordshire, and in that little cafe is what you would describe as a war wall. And on that war wall is every senior figure within the Department of Health and the mission of Cure the NHS and Julie is to get rid of all those people on her wall. And it's a really interesting book and it will talk a little bit about or connect hopefully with what I'm going to talk about here. The other book that I've got and again I'll show a little bit of a slide on that is another book um, which um, some colleagues that I've worked with um, over a number of years have put together and is a simple book called From Know How to Do How and it's by a guy called Dave Corbett and Ian Roberts. And again, I'll just reference a little bit about that and, and why that's quite important. And the, the sort of third book I've got in, in, in the Kindle uh, alongside Fifty Shades of Grey is uh, uh, Deming's um, the, the, the New Economy or The New Economics. Uh, and I want to just talk about that because there were a few things that just chimed a little bit with um, what I heard earlier from some speakers. And what I'm going to describe to you is not actually the Toyota story um, or art story, which are kind of at the one end of the spectrum. I'm just going to describe to you what it's like being at the start of a journey, okay? And just to give you a flavor about some of the things that I'm trying to influence and try and build upon, as Mark has said, some of the work that's gone. So the first thing you'll see up there is a slide. It says, the courage to put the patient first. So, we've had the health service for God knows how many years, um, and are we seriously using the word courage to put the patient first? Did anybody read about Colchester last night or this morning? Are you surprised? Okay. So, maybe as I talk a little bit, the word courage might become a little bit more uh, applicable. Um, there was a conversation about this a little bit earlier, if you remember. Somebody asked a question from over there, um, I think it was to Art, uh, and um, it's a particular quote that, that means something to me. So uh, this is Deming giving his thoughts about the way that education was going. And it was the model that said, what you do if you measure it, you rank it, you get improvement. Okay, and Deming was basically saying, um, it's kind of a thought process that says, never mind the method, manage the results. And Demick's view of that was wrong. Okay. 
And a part of what I would like to introduce to you is what it's like as a quite a new CEO. This is week 77 for me. It's my third CEO role. My background's actually in financial services, telecommunications, local government, as well as health. Okay, so a bit of a background there. But I just want to give you a little bit of a flavour about what it's like having a leadership role and trying to influence in a hospital environment. So that's just a brief picture of us. We're a 350 odd million pound organisation. We serve a population of just under half a million people. Um, as it was alluded to, we're in the great place of Huddersfield, but we're also in the great place of uh, Halifax. We also serve um, people of Hebden Bridge, for example, that is known as the San Francisco of the North. Okay? <laughs> so we certainly do cover um, quite exotic places uh, in terms of where, 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 where I live. And we've, we've got just under 6,000 employees. And um, part of the story I just want to share with you is what that like, what's that like and what that journey is. And this is the kind of brief. So forgive me, and again, I, I recognise that there's colleagues from all over the world here, but um, if, if, if you're not clear why I'm speaking and what I'm going to say, then that gentleman there gave you the brief, so it's his fault in the no-blame culture. Um, <laughs> but really what I'd like to say is, um, what I'm just going to just describe a little bit, is just a little bit of the story and the leadership journey that we've just tried to do and tried to make. And the first thing, and I refer to this um, a little bit, is I think as Art has talked about particularly, um, if somehow you see lean as something that is just a bit like a toolbox that you could just put your hand in. Colleagues will know in our organisation, I use the word tools quite a lot because I'm trying to get people to think differently about what lean is. But I do understand Art's point that actually, if lean is not a part of your strategic and cultural context, then actually what you've got is just a set of initiatives under an umbrella of an organisation, what you've not got is the opportunity to transform. And in my business, and it's probably something I would just say to Art, because Art was doing the comparison between Virginia Mason and he was saying that, you know, basically the, the customer comes in and there's a set of interactions and the customer goes home. But of course, in the business that I'm in, I'm also in the business of start of life, but I'm also in the business of end of life. There's about 35 people per week that die when they come and have care from us every week. So I'm in the business of end of life as well. And so part of my reason for existence is to ensure that as far as possible, where those circumstances are unavoidable, that people have what some people might term is a good death, okay? So it's just trying to get people to understand, yes, it's good to make comparisons, but there are some things that we do that are slightly different. But that does not mean that the principles of lean cannot exist. And what I've just got up here for you is um, something that I'm trying to really promote within our, uh, within our organisation. Some simple concepts that actually mirror some of the language that sits within lean. But this is more for me about the strategy creation end and also the cultural piece. And the diagram to the left is what we call, or to the right, is what we call um, the three R's. Really, really simple. What's my reality now? What's the organisational reality now? Okay. What's the result that we're trying to achieve? And the notion being that result plus, sorry, reality plus response gets you to result. Okay. Really, really simple. Okay. Now, I say it's really, really simple, but I'm trying to influence not just an organisation that's got 5,000 people to start using common language and to think in a common way. It's also the health system, the public health system, and all the other partners that sit within the system, trying to get them to a place with common language. And what I often find with very intellectual people, of which there are many in this room, getting to the place where we establish what it is we're trying to achieve is actually quite the easy part. It's quite the easy part. It might not feel like it at the time, trying to understand what the future state might look like, but actually, with a group of intelligent people, you can usually make that journey in understanding quite quickly. But my challenge always comes around culture. 
There is a saying, I don't know who says it, but somebody who says that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Okay? And the particular element there is what we call the do-how map. Okay? And again, this book is worth a read, and if you do read it, make sure that you do the exercises. It's no point just doing it as a read. Okay? But the do-how map is a part about culture. And I'll be honest with you, you often hear the term values, you often hear the words behaviours. I'm not a great fan of values, okay? Because I can have a value that says, I'm going to be open and I'm going to be honest, okay? But then, if my behaviour is totally the opposite, then for me, the values aren't worth the paper that they're written on. And the reason why I talk about behaviours because at the heart of changing culture is behaviours, okay? So you can have a strategy that says, I want to achieve this, this is the result I want to see, but if what you get, and that's what the big downward arrow is supposed to represent, if what you get are the habitual behaviours that exist within an organisation, what you'll tend to have is what's called the Groundhog Day. Has everybody seen the film with Bill? Groundhog Day keeps waking up every morning and he's in the same place, but his life's getting better each iteration, isn't it? Even though he attempts suicide during that journey. Okay? Okay? But there is a really important thing for me that if you just think about Lean as an initiative, okay, as a thing you want to introduce to your organisation, but actually the behaviours, whether it's you as a leader, a coalition of leaders in your organisation, if your behaviours do not reflect that, then do not be surprised if you have maybe one or two wins, and we've got examples of that in our organisation, but sometimes what I call a big netting back to how we always were. So for me, when I think about Lean, I also think about the strategy creation, being clear about what it is we're trying to achieve, what the end result looks like, particularly for patients, that's why I'm here, okay? But also then, if we're in one place, the reality, we want to move to another place, the result, and we've got to respond, what's the behavioural change that needs to happen consistently in order for the culture to change? And that's the point for me, which has been really one of the challenges within our organisation. You can't read that, don't worry about it. The words unhighted, that highlighted there, talk about patients, they talk about staff. The way I would characterise the result we're trying to see as an organisation is we want to be in a world, actually, where you, because you are all potentially my customers, particularly if you come to uh, our catchment area, um, I want to be in a position, actually, where, first of all, you don't come to the hospital, actually. I don't want to really see you in the nicest possible sense. Um, I prefer not to even see you in the community setting because I'd like to know that you all live healthy lives. OK, I'll pause for a moment. I'd like to know that you all live healthy lives. Um, but that's not necessarily going to happen. So there's an element of prevention, okay? But if you are in a situation where you do start to fall ill, okay, then what I want to know is that, first of all, you don't have to come to your care, that your care comes to you. And if I ask, because somebody in this room will have been ill recently, and if I said to them, has their experience been that the care came to them or did they have to go to the care? I couldn't say absolute terms, but my belief would be you'd probably say you had to go to the care. And one of the things that we find in our way of working is that sometimes people don't see things. So people say we want to be clinically led. That's fine. So I got a cataract in my eye. I get it treated, I get some fantastic clinical outcomes, fantastic. But by the way, I had to work four hours to find a car parking space, okay? It took two hours to get the bloods to me so we could check whether we could even do my cataracts in the first place. So in patient experience terms, it was rubbish. But I got a clinical outcome. We are trying to move to a place where the care comes to the patient, when they need it, because we're going to work hard to make sure they don't need it. But we're also trying to get to a place whereby, as and when that care is applied, actually, your experience of it is a positive experience. Okay. So, 
briefly now, because um, I would like some questions at the end, if possible. I just want to talk about the sort of leadership journey. Um, and I'm hoping, if Art's still with us, um, there'll be a little bit of a, a test. Art, sorry, I'm looking at you there. There'll be a little, I'll come to you earlier and say, how far did I get up the journey uh, in terms of what you described? Um, and I just want to give you a picture of kind of where I feel we've been with some of our key stakeholders and where I'd want to be in the future. So in the green column are some of our key constituents, okay? Some of which, Mark, who's been with us for a long time, he won't have met, even though he's been with us for a long time, but he will have met most. But you'll see we've got, in our architecture, patients, we've got governors, non-executive directors, executive directors, doctors, nurses, therapists. We've got lean specialists, Tanya, wave your hand. Um, and we've got colleagues external working with us and we sit within a wider health economy. As you read, I'm hoping that you can see in the next two columns, a kind of a picture of kind of where we are and a feeling of where we'd want to be and what would be different. And I'm hoping that one of the things that you principally pick up in those slides and in those two columns is the difference between who owns this, who's engaged with this, and how they're engaged with it. There's a particular bit in there where I've talked about the executive directors. And again, there was something that Art said that just reflected in me that it's, it's kind of like maybe a methodology that thinks, you know, lean's a great idea, but you know what? I'll delegate it to somebody in the organization. I'll delegate it to Tanya. Um, so she can be the lean specialist and not a recognition that people like me as chief executive, our board, who are our shareholders, our patients, everybody has a role to play in making sure that actually lean is the way that we do business. And there's real evidence, as you see in the Virginia Mason slide that was shown earlier, there's real evidence about the journey that can be made if as a place you take lean to the heart of your culture and what you do. But these are some of the characteristics and metrics that I would be looking for in the future lean thinking column that would give me a sense. And the, the one thing I would say that is slightly, maybe just a slight different version of what Art was saying. Um, this is my third chief exec role for a different organization. And if there's learning from my first two organizations, it would be this, is that if you build a model of leadership around this, which is built around particularly the personality of the chief executive officer. That's okay, except when the person leads. And if you haven't built a wider coalition of leadership, then potentially what can happen, particularly if you've got a really good charismatic leader, is that as soon as that person moves out and as soon as somebody else comes in and has maybe some different ideas, the ethos can get lost. So that's why when I think about what the future looks like, I'm thinking about the broader church of people who would own this. Because in my view, this is what stops Lean becoming initiatives and starts to make it the way we do business here, as Unipart would say. And so I'm just talking about some of the practical things that I've done. So colleagues, I keep looking to you in that corner. Some colleagues will remember when I issued this letter um, from myself. Um, people know that I'm very, very visible in our organisation. Um, but I sent a letter to some of our most senior clinicians. These are the people who really, really, really cost a lot of money in terms of their time. They really, really do have the most significant patient impacts. These are the people that if you get them to the patient as early as possible, that the chances of quality of care for that inpatient improve exponentially. Okay. But this was a letter that I wrote to them, which is effectively was asking them to take out time. I've just given a little snippet there of what I said. I cannot stress how important enough this work is. Please get involved. Because actually they could have just turned around and said, well, thank you. But unless you're mandating me to get involved, I might not choose to get involved. But I'm pleased to say that in the early part of this year, you know, 33 senior colleagues, doctors, nurses, committed to coming off what I would call the treadmill 
of day-to-day -day care and came into the world of actually let's go see okay and there's a book out on the stand it's 40 quid it's called making hospitals work um, I guess I would characterize myself as Jim which some people may or may not know but if you read that book one of the things it talks about is going to see and this was really really important and here's some real examples of it so just so you don't think I'm just pulling the wool over your eyes here we are people doctors nurses and as I say some of these people can be earning up to a quarter of a million pounds if not more okay some of these people if we've taken them out of direct patient care there is a calculated risk that we might be taking in terms of that patient care so the commitment to go see and understand the basics of improvement science is by no means just something that you choose to do willy-nilly and for those of you who can't read when we were doing some of the analysis there what that says is that the treatment time equals 9 hours 45 minutes to 10 hours 15 minutes that's the cohort and the waiting time was 175 hours to 203 hours would people understand what I'm talking about when I describe that there's a few nods here is that productive time is that productive time for the patient is that productive time for the clinician nah that doesn't work and we are one of the good hospital trusts in this country okay so you're not talking about an organization if there's anybody in there that is fundamentally failing you're talking about an organization that is well respected but when our own clinicians went and looked at the process went and whether it was the the circle standing still or watching and observing their insight and what they saw was pretty amazing for them and we have the OMGs and if I ever I could say to you the thing that will sustain in my view sustain engagement from the wider workforce is when you can produce an OMG for those of us unlike David Cameron who might not know what that means that's oh my god <laughs> okay um, and that little chart there which I know some of you at the back won't be able to see um, that was a map of our current process that if I'm a patient and I turn up to the doorway of our hospital and I've got shortage of breath that's what happens to me on that journey that's the interactions that we mapped okay as a trust and I know there's some gurus in here who will just understand what that is saying but the important thing for me was in our clinical leads doctors nurses and therapists is that moment when they realize I've been here for 15 years I've been doing this I thought I understood this process do you know what I don't but here's the beauty because you can then turn around and say do you know what we can do something about that we can change and this particular oh my god moment I think is really important because if you read a lot of health literature particularly from Royal Colleges etc you'll hear a lot of language about complex patients you'll hear a lot of language about comorbidities one of our oh my god moments was actually the patient isn't complex we're complex as in individual organizations and our subspecialities or if you're a patient who's having to transcend general practice social care and the hospital it's our complexity that creates the complexity not the patient so there's a real opportunity in this to change thinking and all I'm just showing up there is for illustration because we've got a colleague at the back there called Saj because um, you know Saj comes and sees me he's one of our assistant uh, divisional directors and I say to Saj so how are we doing <laughs> how are we doing on this journey um, and here's an example of how we're taking some of that work so that real time invested and some of our clinicians are nervous it's a bit scary okay we're doing some things that sometimes they work and sometimes they don't but what we're pushing and we're trying to get a broad coalition of people that understand that this is the way forward and that particular slide and how we're trying to progress this is not just owned by Saj 
It's owned definitely by me. It's owned by our board. It's even been presented to our membership councillors. And I know they've got a colleague coming on afterwards who's, who's in health and stuff like that will understand some of this. We're really trying to get a broad coalition of people who understand and commit and use the language of improvement that this pertains. And it's catchy. So if I'm shortage of breath, okay, I'm typically turning up in an unplanned fashion, okay? But our business is not just about unplanned care. We also have a part of our business that we describe, it doesn't mean anything to the patients, but we describe it as planned care. So that's when you might come for the NEOP. Okay, I heard a couple of gentlemen talking earlier about NEOPs and stuff. Um, that's called planned care. What I'm encouraged about now, uh, and Mark and colleagues are helping us on this journey, is, and you, you might not be able to see the date, but the date is the 10th of October. And this is a paper to our executive board that is not only talking about the, what we would call unplanned acute element, it's now talking about how we progress lean thinking in terms of the elective element. I do not want to give you a picture of an organisation that's arrived. I just want to share with you kind of the journey and the process that we're going through. And so for me, just some learning points, some points I'd like to share, and something that you know, I really would welcome talking to people or learning to people about whether they've done this particular aspect, but I'll just deal with the learning first. Lean cannot be something that's just an initiative in an organisation. It's either a part of your ether, strategy, culture, or it's not. If it's the latter, i.e. it's not a part, it's just something that it's trendy to do because everybody's doing it, I would just say stop now, okay? But if you really are serious about doing this, and I don't really care, I've got the luxury of saying I've worked across different sectors, so I know that this is not just applicable to health or manufacturing or whatever else. This can apply in any form of business that is out there, any activity. But it's got to be a part of strategy and culture. Leadership, it's about building a broad coalition of leadership, but I absolutely accept the fact that if your chief executive blinks on some of this stuff, then actually there is a chance that it will go back, particularly if the culture of your organisation is hierarchical in nature. Okay, if it's one of those organisations that pushes things up for decision making all the time, because that's historically been the habitual behaviour, the downward harrow moment, then it is important what the chief executive says in terms of driving some of this forward. The oh my God moments are absolutely crucial to convincing an audience, whether it's pro or whether it's skeptical. And you've got to record those, you've got to replay those, and you've got to endlessly communicate how you're making the journey. There is never a time, in my opinion, where you feel that you've arrived. That's the judgment I would make. It is consistent, it is forever in terms of communicating and trying to get engagement and replaying those oh my god moments because that's when you start to get hearts and minds and once you start to demonstrate to people you can make a difference guess what you start to make a difference and as i've said we've got a long way to go this is not an end story this is a story of a journey but i think we are making improvements and most importantly for me i think i can start to tell the difference in our staff but most importantly the patient experience which is what I'm here for but there is one thing I'd like to do further because my experience and I'm, I'm a bit of a, you know I'm, I'm a soft systems methodology geek um, you know there's various geek hoods um, John said and also I've, I've experienced various things through my through my time the one thing I'd like to do more is I believe that we should be getting the patient involved in the current reality or the, the, the current state, the future reality or the future state, and designing out the journey. Uh, and I want to do some work in my time at CHFT, which I hope is a long time, uh, if the regulators don't get me. Um, I really, really, really do hope that what we will start to build in is the patient 
as a part of designing out where we want to be. It's the one thing that when I've looked in some of, you know, whether it's Toyota, whatever else, I, I always see quite elements of the organization, but it's not obvious to me where the patient or the customer sits in that. And I just feel there's even more value to be added from lean as a process, and whether it's a profit margin that you're after, or whether it's a quality of patient care, I feel there's some real opportunities is if we can get patients in the design, not just as observers, participants in the design.